Welcome. It must be five o'clock on Tuesday. Time for another Lombardi Live, and all I can say is I am in the presence of royalty. Last week we talked with a young drummer just coming onto the scene, and today we have a legendary drummer who's been on the scene for six decades. He's played with Frank Sinatra, Duke Ellington, Herbie Hancock, and the list goes on and on. But he's best known and studied by great drummers during his long stints with Tony Bennett and Count Basie. Welcome, the great Harold Jones. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thinking about singers, however, yeah. there's your book, All which is right. Harold Jones, uh, and it says that the, the singer's drummer. Yes. Now, I don't know if there was, when I first saw this, I thought, well, maybe there's a typo here on the front of the book that, that they did. <laughs> I, I put a W in. I think it would be the swingers drummer. <laughs> Certainly fits both categories. Volume two. Volume two. Volume two is coming, right? It's I coming. love that. It, it will be right. You know. Yeah. How do you feel when you're playing behind all these luminary artists? Does it feel more to you like their voice is their expression, as if they were a saxophone player or a trumpet player? Well, the closest one to that would be Sarah Vaughan. When Sarah sang, she I, she'd go in her scat courses. And because she was with Billy Eckstein when he had his big band, and that was Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, and the Cats. So uh, she was the piano player and the second singer in his band. So with her band, she would sometimes sit down and play the piano, but we'd do one of those standard songs, and she'd scat at least one chorus. And it, it was always great because a singer does have to take a breath no matter how long. And so I just sit back there, waiting, hearing them talk and breathe. And when they do, I just jump in on my little bit. And uh, it's just not the trick. Back in singers, is just don't step on the words. So that's why I'm a rhythm section guy. I, I I couldn't be the Buddy Rich type guy. Although I heard Buddy Rich, he was in the rhythm section with Oscar Peterson, Ray Brown, and they backed Ella and Louis. And I swear, I could not believe it was Buddy Rich. It was so good. It really was. Not, not that he ain't good all the time. No, no, but he fit into that. He fit, fit, fit into that format, yeah. Sarah was always one of my favorites, for oh. sure, right? The, the, the divine one, right? The, yeah. the, and Sassy. I was just going to add that. I've the, heard that one many times, well, too. Well, Sassy was after the gig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because we'd just go to her room after the show, you know, and she'd open up, have a brand-new bottle of cognac and take the lid off. And just throw it in the trash. Because <laughs> we weren't leaving until that bottle was going. <laughs> so she hung with the cats, you know. I remember those moments in your life you remember like they were yesterday. You know, I was playing in a show band at North Shore, Lake Tahoe, and they were playing at Harris South Shore. And I would finish at midnight, and it was an hour drive, but I'd be able to get down because she was trading sets with Woody Herman, Jake Hanna. Oh, yeah. So I got there early. She had just finished her set. And it was pretty empty on a weeknight, and she was sitting at the bar area having a cup of coffee, and I was a couple of seats down having a salad, actually, because I hadn't eaten. And she got the bill, and I reached over, and I, she said, well, what are you doing? I said, Sarah, please let me buy this. She says, well, you don't have to do that. She says, I can tell my grandkids I bought coffee for Sarah Vaughn, and that's <laughs> going to be something that'll story I'll tell for the rest of my life. So, oh, that's a good story. That's a good story, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And watching Jake with a big band was a lesson to itself, just like watching you with a big band yeah. is a lesson. Jake, one of my favorite friends and people. Yeah, yeah. Great guy. Yeah, and, and quite a storyteller himself, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to, say, to, say, to say the least. Uh, yeah. So experiences that you've had that you think prepared you for those gigs that young drummers maybe need to reflect on to see what they could be working on to prepare them. Because it's always you have the opportunity and then do you take advantage of the opportunity. That's right. Yeah, the more that you practice and the more that you have your chops up and the more that you know how to read, when the opportunity comes along, you're ready. I mean, it ain't like getting ready after they call. Yeah. The reading is a big one you just brought up. Yes. I, uh, when I first started in Indiana, I went to this the, the, uh, summer music camp, and uh, my mom just said to us, uh, us boys that uh, you're going to learn to play some instrument. It was 13 weeks, five days a week for $13. And, but that was a lot of money then. Though. It was a lucky number for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I uh, uh, did that. And I had really good music teachers back there. And I had a, a guy that was a vaudeville drummer, and he played the pits. 
and his name was Jack Kurkowski. And that's when I learned to play and to read. And the bass drum was so big, you know, we had the lake scene on the front of that front head. And uh, I had the wood block and the cowbell on the bass drum because it was this high. And so it was right there where you needed it. And uh, I, I just learned to read like that. And uh, uh, everything, because I, when you're young, nothing seems hard or weird. And yeah, it's, you don't mind learning to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star because you're, you're, that, that's what you're growing up with. So uh, it was easy for, easy for me to learn it like that. And then that's why by the time I was 15, I was playing on a drum set. And uh, my mom would drive me to Indianapolis to play with Wes Montgomery because he was one of the cats in Indiana. And then uh, uh, I, I got a scholarship to the American Conservatory of Music in Chicago. That's what took me to Chicago. Then when I was up there, uh, man, I don't remember eating or sleeping. Well, that's where you made your mark. Right? Yeah, yeah. And we had a jazz band, Herbie Hancock, Reggie Willis. I can't remember the other names right now. But we would play the off nights at the jazz club. And the jazz guys that were coming through was Miles and his group. So I got to play on the drums. I, at that time, he had Jimmy Cobb. So I got to play on his drum set. Uh, he had Art Blakey come through. I remember going up and asking Art Blakey the day before. Uh, I was there to hear him on the night before we were going to play. And I said, uh, Mr. Blakey, uh, would you mind if I uh, used your drum set tomorrow? And he roughly said, what do you mean asking me if you're going to use a drum set? Of course you can. <laughs> he, but he scared me just in saying I could. <laughs> yeah, but Art was that way. He was over nice. And uh, then I had Max Roach. I got, got to play on his set because he came through with uh, – uh, it wasn't Clifford Brown at that time. I was in Chicago when him and Clifford, when Clifford died. And, uh, but I was a big fan of Max Roach. because oh, of he, course. He, yeah, and he soloed within the form of the song. And I hadn't quite heard any drummer do that up to that, except for somebody like maybe Louis Belson that would do it in and out. That's, when Louis was with Duke, he, there was a song called Skin Deep. I know that well, yeah. Man, that was one of my favorite drum solos of all time. Yeah. I mean, these are names you out there you have to Google and check out and, and the tracks that these people played on also. Yes. When you sat in on Art Blakey's drum set, did that did that automatically bring that crush roll that sounded like <laughs> it was a, a thundering train coming at you? <laughs> I, I'm going to say it just might have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I remember him sitting very high, too. You know, yeah, I remember Because he was that a short too. guy. Yeah. He wasn't as tall as me, but he sat high. You no, know, his legs were almo almost like you were barely resting on a stool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But a feel that, you know, and talking about feel, yeah. uh, when you're playing with different artists, do you uh, adjust a little bit knowing what they're looking for? Well, I'm going to say like when you're with someone like Ella Fitzgerald, it's a very clean sound you want to keep going. And yeah, I guess you want to look for what every one of them are looking for. But like with Ella, I had a great rhythm section there with uh, Tommy Flanagan and Keeter Betts. These are the best musicians in the world you're talking about. Yes. That's what, that's what, that was what the beauty of it all was. Uh, and I'm, I'm like that new song, that new girl. It's all about the bass. <laughs> the bass. So I've had Ray Brown. I've had a Jim Huart. I got one now that was with Tony. Uh, Chuck uh, Burkhoffer you played with? Yes, I played with Chuck. Many, many of recordings. We did some Robbie Williams things that uh, were number one in England. And uh, some of the songs even made the soundtrack on Finding Nemo. So, uh, yeah, playing with these, different, with these different rhythm sections, you have a little family. And... Uh, uh, I would say that each singer, some singers like uh, Carmen McRae, you had to really be kind of soft, and you had to have a back on your chair because things were going so slow, you you didn't want to fall off. And, but uh, uh, with Sarah, you had to be up on the front edge of it. There's a great thing, a great video that's come out with, uh, with Sarah and Wynton Marcellus with uh, the Boston Symphony 
and John Williams is conducted. Wow. And man, there's a couple of things on there that are burning. I, I didn't know I was there. I, I mean, it's really good. That's when Winton was very young, because this had to be, what, the 80s. Any drummer that would have the opportunity to play with any one of the people that you played with would say, I've had a successful career. And when you just look at all of the best singers in the world and musicians in the world and being in those rhythm sections to back them up, yeah. uh, you've certainly left your heart in San Francisco more than any other drummer I've ever <laughs> would oh. ever meet. There's no question about that. Yeah. Uh, so, and working with Tony, uh, that, yeah. that experience, tell me a little yeah. bit about that. Well, it was great because he treated us all like gentlemen. In other words, if he stayed at the Ritz-Carlton, we had to stay there. But like I said, uh, I had to pay for the $35 hamburger. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then I just check and say, hey, man, the fries come with that? Because yeah, right. <laughs> I was hungry. <laughs> sure. But... You couldn't you couldn't knock it because he wanted you in the best hotels right where he was, you know. So I appreciated that. Sarah Vaughn was the same way. So was Ella. Uh, well, I think all of them were. Well, Sammy Davis wasn't. He was kind of a, a different. But you see, when I was with Basie, when we went to Vegas, we'd work Caesar's Palace, and we couldn't even stay in that hotel. Wow. Yeah. We'd come in the back door, go into the, up and on the stage, do the show, and go out the back door. And, well, it was something that they were already doing. Everybody was used to it, so I, it, I wasn't negated by it. It didn't bother me because we'd stayed, all stayed at a little hotel down the street that there were 17, 18, 19 with the handlers and stuff. 19 people in the band. We'd stay at a hotel that had 20 rooms. <laughs> so you were it. We were it, man. We'd have parties at those places, and uh, it was always even more of a ball than being, being in the stuffy place. Yeah. Thinking about Buddy Rich, I remembered another occasion when I was in Vegas. Buddy was playing across the street, and uh, I'd get over and, and have a chance to watch him on our breaks. But one night, the Basie band came in. It was their night off. 
uh, I don't know what, what era that what would have been uh, 64, 65. Uh, and Buddy always played great, but when that when he saw them walking in and listening to his set, he just how how I could say he turned it up another notch is almost yeah. unbelievable. But he yeah. he turned it up that other notch, you know. Yeah. He was gonna like I'm gonna show these guys yeah. what I got here too, you know. Yeah. You told the story uh, when we were having you with our interview here on Drum Channel about the Basie band going to Europe and having to cut back on their freight, their weight. What they left out was the music. Yeah. <laughs> how could that? <laughs> so how, what was that? You were at the airport and <laughs> and and it, it was an overweight problem. Yeah, a lot of and it was a one one off gig, I think. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. what? What? And they said, "Can you cut back?" And you're like, "Well, I'm taking two pair of underwear. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> how can I cut back on the weight?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who came up with the idea of? Uh, <laughs> Let's just leave the charts behind. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I'm sure it was one of the guys that counts the money. Maybe yeah. like Lockjaw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was a straw boss. And that's that's yeah. what you call knowing your charts, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This book I totally recommend. It's not only a, a great drummer's book to read, but uh, it's a, a slice of history of music of, of those eras. And growing up in the 60s, being influenced by... John Coltrane when he came on the scene as a 15 year old in 1960 and taking the needle and putting it back on the Miles albums all through that history and listening to Jimmy Cobb over and over again. The needle, uh, well, you're really old. So, so, <laughs> well, just, you remember the needle. Oh, yeah. I didn't have to crank it though, wait a minute. You, know, so, <laughs> yeah, you, okay. you beat me by a couple years there. Y yeah. What the world was like back in the 60s, 70s, the jazz world, your opportunities in those early years for you. Well, in those early years, I mean, like Chicago, downtown Chicago, that you could walk around a block and there would be, you'd, you'd pass 12 clubs around the block. And you could stand outside. It was almost like New Orleans with the doors standing wide open. You could hear everything and see everything. And you'd go in and get a beer for a buck. And uh, even though that was a lot of money back then, but you only had to have the one beer. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, you could hear all of these great, great bands, I called them at the time. And I remember one jam session place in Chicago. I got up on the stand and uh, with my, with Herbie Hancock. And uh, the, the guys, uh, the guys on the bandstand, they're looking at us, us two young cats. And they're saying, okay, um, uh, Herbie said, might have said, okay, what are you going to play? The guy said, uh, Let's do back home again in Indiana. And I mean, they started off, the guy said, okay, here we go. One, two, one, two, three, four. And you know, and and I was able to do it. And Herbie was able to do it. So we sat there and then we're playing along after a couple of courses and then they start taking it through the keys. Well, Herbie went right through the keys with them, boy. <laughs> so I mean, by the time that tune ended, I think we were accepted. You were, you were there. Yeah, man. we were on, on the scene in Chicago. And there's a great comment in your in your book here too, which I thought was wonderful. It says, whether you're playing with a melody on your instrument, singing the lyrics, or improvising a jazz solo, you have to keep the song in mind and in your heart. That's that. How much does that mean to you? Well, it means well everything, because as a, a, drummers are the only ones that normally didn't have to know where they were in the song. They just take off playing. You know, and uh, not knowing the song or the form of the song. And I learned to play within the form of the song and keep keep the form of the song in my mind so that I know if they're going to get ready to go into a bridge or something, it's going to be a good place to start filling or to start building. building. Or if we're going into a new course, except when back in those days with Johnny Griffin and Sonny Stitt, these guys would play, they'd play for 45 minutes, a 45 minute song, then they do a 45 minute tag. <laughs> I mean, one song would be an hour and a half. And and uh, uh, you, you'd have to just keep filling and, e and making each thing, try to build each thing up, you know, but you could only get up so high. The next thing you know, you're hanging from the ceiling. So, uh, 
you you need to know your form of your song just so that you can keep that that to me it helps the drummer to play the way the way that uh that it'll fit the fit the band and the tune yeah uh we have a great lesson on drum channel greg Bissonette did and terry bozio has done about song form uh -huh. which a lot of young musicians miss and actually uh talking with um one of the teachers at Berkeley College of Music, I was shocked because I said in the audition requirements for Berkeley, what are the areas that most drummers fall down on? And I thought it might be reading or technique or their knowledge of the rudiments, but he said no. He said we'd get to a point where we'd say play a 12-bar blues and they didn't understand the song form because they'd never been exposed to that really because they've been listening to cover songs on the radio and what have you but never really thought about the beginning, the middle, the beginning, the middle, of, end of a song. Right, uh, right. And that is so, so important. Right, so. and I, in my going around to teaching at different colleges or some places, uh, uh, the band directors, they can teach everybody in the band how to play their instrument and tell them what to do, except that drummer. The drummers were usually the weakest link because nobody knew how to tell the drummer how to play. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, the drummers hadn't quite had the same, I don't know what word to use, but same training. Yeah, well, we have uh, a great other course that Chad Wackerman did, because uh, Chad, of course, grew up through his middle school and high school with his dad being the band director who was a drummer, which is why all of the four kids in that family are great musicians. But, but the course that he has on is just learning how to interpret a chart. So I think a lot of young drummers learn how to read quarters, eight, sixteen, typically. But as yeah. soon as you get into that stage band, uh, if you start reading everything that's up there, it ain't gonna swing. Right. Uh, so right. you need to learn how to you, in interpret it. You need to know how to read, but not enough to hurt your plane. There you go, I love that. There's a good saying. That's, yeah. that's a byline for the day right there. Okay. So, so, so. <laughs> what was your experience like with Natalie Cole and doing that, doing that record? That was great, that was a big family. That was a family on the road. I I'd never been in that situation with a uh, tour buses, and that was my first time of experience of doing a tour bus. And uh, she we she got our the musicians had their own tour bus, and you got talk about the gig or the music or the girls on every ride, and it was like didn't matter how far you had to go. I mean, we was always you know talking, and there were stories coming out. It, that was what was really great. It was like a family. And with Natalie, even the crew became part of the family. When we weren't working or we were at a hotel, we'd all hang out together. So I hadn't been with anybody that had crews. With every, everything else was, we all got in one station wagon, you know, and went to the gig. And uh, But with Natalie, she had like three tour buses and two 18-wheeler trucks. Because when you looked at the stage, everything on that stage was hers. They laid the floor, which had all the markings where everything went. They brought in the piano and the curtains and the lights and everything. So everything on that stage was her, her image. Uh, the way that we, re we rehearsed down here someplace for about three or four weeks to get this show down. And... Uh, uh, when we went out, it was the same, and it was beautiful, and that that was one of the greatest tours because when I look at the audience, you see three generations of the same family came to the show together. Now, that's what I loved. And back about then, uh, uh, young kids didn't know much about this kind of music, even, even today. <laughs> but uh, no, Natalie was a great family tour. Yeah. But any sp specific moment in your musical career that stands out to you, it's like, can't believe I'm here or doing this, or that uh, that was like a, a pivotal moment even in your in your early days. Well, traveling with Basie, there was a couple of times that I, when things would come up, you know, that like I remember we were getting ready to go down south and do a southern tour, which I hadn't been down south on a tour. This would be about what year? 68, 69, and uh, back then I had a great big afro. All right, I remember that. Yeah, okay. Now, because the afro was considered a rebellious sign or image, 
Because that's where they were Angela Davis and yeah. Huey Newton and all of them were wearing the afros. So it was considered negative. So uh, a couple of the guys on the band said, hey, bass, you got to tell this drummer he's got to cut his hair. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, we're going down south. We don't want him to think that we're so-and-so. And so for Basie, he got up from his seat and he came over to me and he looks up at me and he just cocked his head and saw that. He said, is that the way they wear it nowadays? And I just said, yeah. <laughs> but I went out and got a haircut the next day. <laughs> so uh, he had a way of telling you how to do something. And uh, same thing happened when they we first started wearing a necklace. The, uh, it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a manly thing to do to wear a necklace, so I had this uh, at the time I had this neat beaded. It was all made by hand. You're a trailblazer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the guys in the band complained about that, and Basie came over and he said, looked at it again, and he says, "Is that what they're wearing nowadays?" And I said, "Well, yeah." <laughs> The next day, Count Basie had on a gold chain. <laughs> and from then on, it was settled. I mean, chains were in. You were able to wear one. They didn't think it was manly to wear it, but it was. And we turned it around that one. One of the greatest drummers of all time and an icon in fashion also. <laughs> little, little did we know that. Well, Breaking news on Drum Channel. <laughs> I don't know. I was watching all those other cats who were their fashions. The musicians were setting the fashions. Miles Davis and his zoot suits and the skinny tie. Billy Eckstein, he had a collar that was so big, you turned it around and then buttoned it. It went all the way around. And, and that was the Mr. B collar. But the, the musicians were setting the styles, yeah. What was the trick on getting the Basie band to sound like one person? I mean, it's just like, the, it was so united. Uh, the dynamic levels, everything. It's just like it was, it, it just stood apart from anything else. Well, that is true. That is true. But the, the, the basic band, I want to say, the sections maintained themselves, each section. And they would talk to the other guys who tell them how it should sound and this and that. And fortunately, I was in the, ba the rhythm section and Basie was in my section. So the only guys that ever told me what to do was the bass player, Norman Keenan and the guitar, Freddie Green. And they were on both sides of me. And I mean, Freddie Green would tell me, and hey, you, you gotta start that fill, you gotta start leading up to this uh, shout course. When the horns are all coming in, you gotta start a couple of bars early. Cause I was waiting like a jazz drummer, gonna hit it right with them hot dog stuff. But no, you gotta start it early and build it right up so they're, they're, they can all get their breath together. And that helped them all breathe together. So that, that that kept it clean too, because I heard Duke Ellington's band man a couple of times. I mean that band was like you're on a ship. I mean as loose as it was. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I think with Basie's band. We each did it in our in their our own particular section. With me, we're having the guitar right here and the bass right here. When we played together. It was like when you're practicing at home with a metronome. If you really get good, you can't hear the click of the metronome. And it was just like that with the rhythm section. My hi-hat uh, and the guitar, man, they were so married that uh, it was just like one over there. I'm just saying, um, I, I still have trouble with not having the bass and the guitar or any of my cats in the rhythm section close enough to reach out and touch them because they put us at the mercy of the of the room that you're playing in and the bigger the room the more mercy you need but uh they and then they want you to look big on the stage so they put everybody farther away and i mean i'm starting to hear then now i'm hearing the bass after it's come back from the wall or something so that's why i tell them i want them as close to me as i can so i hear it first before it goes out into that room and uh, amplifiers help, yes, and, and a monitor. Nowadays, they can get the monitor in, so that helps for the new breed if they want to have the bigger setup. Yeah. Tell me if I'm old-fashioned, but uh, for me, you just can't replace an upright bass in that type of genre. I mean, you, as opposed to an electric bass. You cannot replace the up upright. No, 
the upright is part of the sound. And I know some good Fender players, and you know, and but uh, it, it's just got to be the acoustic upright bass for the full sound. And I, I, I stress that I, I couldn't have a, a a Fender player in a big band. It's just too uh, too clean. What I hear is just if you're looking at playing walking bass line. On the upright bass, there's so much space between each one of those beats that you can find the middle of it, the beginning of it, the back of it, yes. as opposed to it being more like a, a, a metronome. Yes, yes. Which is where you're swinging, you know, this is where the swinging comes from in the singing drummer. <laughs> uh, yes. So, yeah. so it's <laughs> important for young bass players out there to learn both instruments, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't hear many young kids playing the upright because it's it's hard to well you got to transport it around and uh, that's one problem you, you you always gonna have weather problems weather conditions so uh, um, it it's a hassle the upright bait's a hassle I know you know when when I was with Ella Fitzgerald we played a gig on an airplane in flight. It was the DC-10. For the people on the plane? For the people on the plane. The, the dc tent had a lounge. You could go back to where the bar area was and everything. And we had, we had the, they had a piano there. He brought the bass on with him. And I had a mini set. And we played on the airplane in flight of a DC-10. So very few people know that ever happened. <laughs> no. Yeah. And and I do know bass players, their bass is their baby. They will actually buy a ticket and put it in the seat next to them. They're not going to ship yeah. it. Yeah. That's and and that, that's true. And, and because the bass doesn't fit in coach, they had to buy a first class ticket. And then because it was so big and obtrusive, somebody had to buy a ticket to sit in the chair next to it. <laughs> so uh, you had to buy two first class tickets to tra transport that base. Now, Tony Bennett takes a private plane. That's how he put that base on the plane. And it laid back on the couch. I can only imagine as you're sitting here today, just looking back at that career, is that, are, are you a bit in awe that all this happened to me in my life uh, in terms of the great friendships that you've had and the people that you've met? Well, well, I don't know if I'd say I'm in awe, but yeah, the great friendships and the people that I've met over all the years. It's, it's like having family, an extended family. When you're hanging out with all these people, it's great to have people like that to, to sit at the coffee, to have coffee in the morning, and you're talking about things in life. It's all positive, and it's a great thing. And your life experience comes through in the music. Yes. Yeah, and you'd, you'd, you'd find it a lot, the way a lot of these guys think and, a, and act, the music sounds like that. And you're still very active. Yeah. So yeah. What, what's, what's coming up? I know uh, not this year because everything is still a little bit coming back, but... Right, right. But uh, I'm uh, doing this, this new girl, Josephine Beavers. Then uh, I got some guys writing some charts for my big band. Tell me about that. That is what... I look forward to doing it my own big band, and I'm going to try to run it like Basie. I want everybody in the band to be better than me. <laughs> so, hey. so. And some of your favorite drummers, we mentioned some earlier on, but some names that we can, as we're closing here, that you would think young drummers should look at. Obviously, Harold Jones and other okay. drummers of the era. Uh, well, I'm going to go back to the first, and Louis Belson. Yep. Uh, Max Roach, Philly Joe Jones. Uh, Kenny Clark, uh, Art Blakey, Elvin Jones. Uh, there was all, all of those guys. Now, see, I don't end up talking about the guys that were swingers in big bands like Jake Hanna, Mel Lewis, but uh, they should listen to all of them to hear how they've set a band up and how they keep the band going. And um, uh, you, the, your instrument, you need to know what kind of sound you want um, on your 
on your cymbals and your drums because that sound is what's going to dictate what your sound is. I mean, my sound is not like a, a bebop drummer. They, the heads are tightened up a lot more. It's on how you have, what, whatever kind of music you're going to play. You got to have, have that in mind on tuning of the drums. That's part of you, actually. Every, yes. every single drummer has their own part of their expression, I think. Yeah. yeah. And the book is available. <laughs> Where at? Amazon. Amazon. Like everything else. <laughs> yeah, exactly right, right. And in addition to this, you have a book out with Danny Gottlieb, is that right? Yes, yes. Tell and me a little about that. It, he he uh, composed a book that has, has uh, the bassy tunes in there that I played, and then what I played on the... Transcribed, actually. One, yes. He He's down there at that University of Miami, one of those technic technicians, and they can take off a quarter note a dotted quarter note, double dotted quarter note. <laughs> You're looking at it and going, did I play that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I'm glad I didn't have to read this first. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. There's a lesson there, too. Yeah. Harold, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank this you. Is, this is very exciting for me, and all of you kids out there, and older kids, too, and people my age, uh, watch, listen to Harold Jones. Go on to YouTube, get the book, get Danny Bot Gottlieb's book also, and it's only going to help your playing at whatever level you're at. Can't, can't deny that. Harold, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, pleasure. Yeah. And okay. we'll see you next year when you're on the road. All right. All right, and we'll see you next Tuesday. You don't have to go on the road. <laughs>